Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of events highlighting the various tours available to book through Indus Experiences. Overseas travel has been badly affected by the COVID pandemic, but we hope that we will be able to get back to exploring the world in 2021. Indus Experiences offer a range of bespoke tours to destinations across the Asian continent, and we're going to be putting on a series of events over the next few months in order to highlight where and how you can see some of the fabulous destinations they can take you to. Today's event centers around the tour to Kohima Ridge in India, the site of a battle in 1944 where the invasion of India by the Japanese Imperial Army was halted by the bravery of a small garrison of just 1,500 British and Indian soldiers who, although outnumbered by about 10 to 1, held out for 14 days until relieved by the British 2nd Division. Soon we will hear a presentation from Bob Cook, a retired warrant officer for the British Army who leads battlefield tours to Kohima. Before we hear from Bob, we will receive an update from Asiya Zaga, Director of Marketing for Indus Experiences. Asiya's interest in travel naturally stemmed from her father's passion for travel. She has been with the company for 14 years, but has been the head tea girl there for the last 25 years. Starting from the grassroots, she's been involved in all areas of business from admin, operations, sales, and now marketing. Over the last decade, she's been very fortunate to have visited numerous countries, including India, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Morocco, Jordan, Malaysia, Croatia, Finland, and Turkey. So welcome back to the UK, Asiya. Now over to you. Thank you for joining our online event today. Before I hand over to Bob to talk about the Battle of Kahima, I would like to introduce Indus Experiences. Set up by my father, Yasin Zargar, 25 years ago, Indus Experiences is an award-winning tour operator that has grown out of his passion for travel and an unrivaled level of specialist expertise in organizing holidays to Asia. We pride ourselves in the exceptional customer service that we offer our clients, along with our integrity and ethical approach to business. We handcraft holidays for curious travelers who want an immersive experience in Bhutan, Burma, Cambodia, India, Laos, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and most recent destination, Uzbekistan. We tailor make bespoke tours for individuals and offer well-priced small group tours for clients wishing to travel with like-minded guests. Our goal is to enable every client to enjoy a unique and unforgettable experience and to gain a deep insight into the local cultures and traditions of each country they visit. Naturally, we are committed to a sustainable approach to tourism and to preserving the precious heritage of our destinations. Thanks to our painstaking approach and willingness to go the extra mile, we achieve an excellent level of customer satisfaction, which in turn translate into high rates of repeat business. Over 90% of our clients have traveled with us twice or more or referred their families and friends. We are based in Harrow, Northwest London. Due to current circumstances, we are operating a closed doors policy, but you can get in touch with us by phone or by email. Alternatively, if you would like to set up a Zoom call to discuss your holiday plans, please do make an appointment by emailing us. Thank you for logging in today. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope we have the opportunity to arrange your travel in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that update, Asiya. We're now going to see a presentation on the Battle of Kahima Ridge and the tours provided by Indus Experiences. And for that, I will introduce Bob Cook. So Bob was a soldier in the British Army for 34 years, leaving as a Sergeant Major. He retired to York and took over the Kahima Museum as a volunteer curator in 2008. He has led eight tours to Kahima over the last six years, every time learning something new about the Battle and Burma campaign. He's also a trustee of the Kahima Educational Trust, which provides educational opportunities for the descendants of the Naga tribesmen who gave so much in support during the war. Thanks, Bob. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, the events leading up to the Battle of Kahima began well before the war started. The attitudes of the politicians and the civilian administrators helped to shape and constrain the thinking of the military commanders which in turn allowed the Japanese the complete military success that they enjoyed in the five months following Pearl Harbor as they swarmed across the whole of the Far East. The rapid successful advance of the Japanese Imperial forces 
brought them to the very borders of India and left the British and Indian high command reeling. Along the way, the armed might and the political sovereignty of the British Empire took some devastating hits. The after effects of the political situation are still being felt today, but the military recovery was somewhat quicker and brings us to the start of 1944. Some events have already taken place, but the main event is about to start. The Japanese began their advance uh, on the 7th of March, 1944. If you look at the slide there down at the bottom, the, the, the commander of the Japanese 15th Army, Lieutenant General Renya Mutaguchi, ordered his 33rd Division across the Chindwin River. Their mission was to roll up the British and Indian forces uh, from the south and west of Imphal as they begin their encirclement of four corps, which is centered on Imphal itself. They have been committed early to battle as they had the furthest to go. This was the start of the invasion of India, codenamed Operation Yugo. A week later, on the 15th of March, Muraguchi committed these remaining two divisions, the 15th Division uh, and the 31st Division, to cross the Chindwin River. The 15th Division was to capture the main stores distribution depot at Kangla Tongbi and then to complete the encirclement of four corps from the north and the east. Our main interest, however, is the 33rd, 31st Division, commanded by Lieutenant General Kotuko Sato. His orders are simple. He has advanced across the Somra Hills of northeastern Assam to reach the main supply route between Dimapur and Imphal. You'll see that his advance from east to west uh, is from east to west, but his route takes him over uh, hills which run north to south. Sato is to cut and hold the MSR to prevent reinforcements from reaching four core Imphal. His objective is a small hill station called Kohima. It's just over 100 miles from his objective, uh, and the strength of his division varies depending on which book you read, but I place it normally at around about 16,000 men. This came as a surprise to the Allies, as the route taken by Sato was considered to be militarily imp impassable uh, for a force larger than a regiment. The Japanese were not aware of this opinion. Lieutenant General Bill Slim, who is the commander of the Fort Indian 14th Army, is aware that Japanese are advancing westwards. As a result of successes elsewhere on the wider battlefield, he has already redeployed the 161st Indian Brigade to Dimapur. Their job is to probe forward east of Kohima and act as a tripwire warning of the Japanese advance. However, as the Japanese advance westwards, misleading and contradictory orders within the British and Indian chain of command led this brigade to be pushed and pulled between Dimapur and Kohima, a distance of some 55 miles each way. Finally, as order descended, the situation became clearer and they were sent forward to Kohima again, although by the time they got there, on the 5th of April, 1944, Sato had arrived, uh, having cut the road south of Kohima on the Imphal side. Slim has already committed his reserves in support of four corps at Imphal. With the advance of the Japanese, he realized he had left a gaping hole in the defense of India. He asked for more troops, uh, and the only troops which were easily available and ready were the 2nd British Infantry Division, commanded by Major General John Grover. Grover's 2nd Division were headquartered uh, in the Belguama area of southwest India. You can see here it's circled. Uh, they now needed to get across India to the northeast, follow the line in the rough passage which they took up to the over circle. Grover was ordered to concentrate his division at Dimapur. His precise orders, which followed him across, in, in, across India, were as simple as Sato's. He was to open and keep open the main supply route to allow reinforcements to get to the relief of, in, of four corps at Imphal. However, while Sato had just 100 miles to go to reach his objective and had started three days earlier, Grover, who received his orders on the 18th of May, uh, March, had about 2,000 land miles to go. His division is also about 16,000 strong. However, it is a mechanized division and its logistic trail is exceptionally long. From a strategic point of view, Kohima is not that important. It contains a hospital, bakeries, a general purpose transport depot, other supply depots, 
a, a convalescent camp and a battlefield casualty replacement camp. There are also other admin, uh, sorted admin units uh, scattered around there, all of which commanded by the garrison commander, Colonel Hugh Richards, who is an experienced infantry officer. Mm -hmm. So Kohima is not really that strategically important. Neither Mudaguchi nor Slim ever expected a decisive battle to be fought uh, at Kohima. The smart money was on Dimapur, which was a massive 24 square mile logistics hub, uh, including a railhead and an airhead. Uh, as well as being the gateway to India proper from the east. All indications were that Dimapur was the objective of the Japanese advance. However, because Kohima sat astride the MSR, its position in history is about to be cemented into place. The main defences of Kohima were 450 men of the 4th Battalion, the Royal West Kent Regiment, who were part of 161 Brigade, which, if you remember, has already been deployed to, to that area. There's remnants of the Assam Regiment, a newly formed regiment, uh, formed in 1942, uh, and elements of the Assam Rifles, a paramilitary group. In addition, there are the men from the convalescent camp, the reinforcement camp, uh, and what they termed as odds and sods, which are men who have been ice soldiers who have been isolated in Kohima by the cutting of the road. The total uh, of uh, fighting men are estimated, therefore, to be about 1,500 which puts the, them at a disadvantage of about 10 to 1 over the, the, the Japanese. In addition, there is 1,000 non-combatant troops. Here we see, uh, coming in from the, from the, the left-hand side, we see the road from Dimapur. It's bounded in black there. It snakes all the way around the uh, Kohima Ridge and falls away down to the bottom of the sketch map towards Imphal. The Kohima Ridge... Uh, the main defensive positions on here are occupied by the 4th Battalion of West Kent. They are Garrison Hill at the top here, Cookie Picket, the Field Supply Depot, which is called Supply Hill here, uh, and the Daily Issue Store, which is called Detail Hill. These are all occupied by the 4th Battalion of Royal West Kent. On the top right-hand corner there, we'll see which is the DC's compound, which contains the famous tennis court, uh, and then the hospital spur, these are defended and occupied by the Assam Regiment and the Assam Rifles. Further down the bottom here we see Transport Ridge uh, and Jail Hill. These are defended by the odds and sods, the, uh, the men uh, from the, the uh, reinforcement camp and the convalescent camp. The position now has changed. Now the, because of the, uh, it's inevitable that with the, the Japanese outnumbering the British and Indian defenders by over 10 to 1, that they're going to push forward despite the accuracy of our artillery, which on several occasions break up attacks before they even start. These guys now uh, within the, the blue lines there, the perimeter, are completely cut off uh, and being resupplied by air. During the day, the, the uh, defenders are subject to artillery and mortar attack and sniper fire. And while the, during the evening, for most of the night, they're subject to attack after attack by ground infantry. The big problem they have here is the, is the water. There's no sort of freestanding water, uh, and, uh, but eventually the, uh, they find a small outlet where they're able to resupply water bottles individually, uh, but only by night. Attempts to drop uh, water by parachute uh, or free dropping it uh, in rubber uh, inner tubes is not always proved successful. The men are restricted to a, about three quarters of a pint of water per day for all purposes. Most of the water that's left is going to the, the medical teams and to the wounded. The uh, early onset of the monsoon tends to relieve some of the water situation, but with it, it brings other problems such as malarial mosquito, leeches, ticks, and bugs of many other types of bugs. They, it also turns the ground into a quagmire of uh, glutinous mud and human remains, especially around the areas where the fighting is heaviest. As you can see from here, that the, where the, war, the road snakes around from Dimapur uh, down to Imphal, whoever commands this area of ground commands the road. Okay, now the garrison hold this ground at the moment, but Sato desperately needs it to consolidate his position. So ultimately the fighting is for control of the road. Here we see the situation as at the 18th of April. You see in the little box down on the left-hand side there. The perimeter has been pushed forward. The men have now been uh, uh, exhausted. The night of the 17th of April is the most 
serious of uh, the, these nights for the, the, the beleaguered garrison. The second division has moved up. They've, had, they've crossed the 2,000 miles of India. They've uh, con concentrated at Dimapur, and now they've been fighting the way up the road, uh, taking, uh, destroying all the Japanese that they encounter and taking all the Japanese positions. They can't afford to leave anyone, any Japanese soldier behind them. They come up, they're about five miles away now from the, from the Kohima Ridge, uh, but the, the, the Japanese are pressing on all sides. The guys inside the perimeter are completely exhausted. Had the Japanese been able to push just a little bit harder at this point, they may have broken through the perimeter and, and captured the whole of the Kohima Ridge. But the Japanese, they, they couldn't try any harder. On the 18th of, uh, of April here, the siege of Kohima was breached. The walking wounded, the older admin troops, and the non-combatants started to be evacuated down a steep, uh, a steep hill down at, by hospital spur uh, to wait and transport, which took them away to, um, to Dimapur. Over the 19th and the 20th of April, the siege is breached. Uh, the, siege, the siege is lifted completely. The, the uh, defending troops are relieved uh, position by position by the relatively fresh troops of the second division who come in and take over. However, the, uh, Grover has now lifted the siege. His, his orders are still not fulfilled yet because he now has to clear the Japanese of all the positions which they hold on the Kohima Ridge up until now. Uh, uh, and it takes him another seven weeks to do this under intense pressure from Lieutenant General Montague Stockford, his uh, corps commander, who is in turn under intense pressure from the army commander, General Slim. The fighting is hand to hand. The, there's no quarter asked, no quarter given. During one of the attacks, uh, a, Bren, a Bren gun, one of our Bren guns is jammed. As the gunner tries to re, uh, release the jam, he's, he's bayoneted by the enemy. His number two on the gun picks up a shovel and kills one Japanese guy, uh, soldier with the, the shovel and chases the other ones away, uh, keeps them at bay until he's relieved. Uh, and uh, reinforcements come along. Here we see uh, a, a panoramic, a great panoramic photograph taken from uh, the position as the aircraft comes over a place called Merrimer Hill. You can see the, uh, the defensive position here slurch, snaking off to the right is the road to Dimapur, and it comes in around, it goes round by the, the, uh, the red circle there, which is the, the bottom of Garrison Hill, the DC's compound. And then you see it snaking off around in front of Jail Hill, off down to Imphal. General Grover, when he has come onto the scene, he, his dispositions have been made by, by the use of aerial reconnaissance photographs such as this, but they don't give the true picture. Uh, and when he sees the situation on the land itself, he has to then deploy, uh, one of his brigades comes right on a wide sweeping left hook, which comes under the ridge uh, where this photograph has been taken above. Uh, he sends his second brigade around, sweeping right the way around to the right. They're coming in at the top by GPT Ridge there. Uh, well, he keeps his third brigade to punch through the center. Attack after attack are met with stubborn and fanatical resistance by the Japanese until on the 11th and 12th of May, over the 11th and 12th of May, uh, the position of DIS, which is down here just by Jail Hill, uh, position DIS uh, and FSD is taken as well as Jail Hill and this sets the scene now for the, the, the Japanese are finally pushed off the Kohima Ridge and Grover can now set uh, about clearing the road down to Imphal. However, the Japanese General Sato, true to his orders, he is maintaining the, the road being cut. Uh, he goes over the, onto the defensive and despite many repeated requests to Mudaguchi for ammunition and other vital supplies, which remain unfulfilled, Sato continues to deny the road to Grover. However, th with the uh, advantage increasingly with Grover, Sato was left with no choice he, uh, uh, but to order a general withdrawal down the road to Imphal uh, and leave him behind a rear guard action to, to cover his retreat. Sato becomes the first Japanese general in their whole history to retreat from the face of the enemy, uh, from the battlefield in the face of the enemy. Grover, of course, chases him all the way down. Uh, they're, they're, fight, they're over in a fighting retreat. 
they're, they're restricted to the road because of uh, other our forces are, are operating on the left flank uh, and the hillsides on the right flank keep him straight down to onto the road until on the 22nd of June 1944 Grover's leading elements of troops from the second division shake hands or touch hands with the leading elements of the 5th Indian Division which is pushing its way up from Imphal. The battle for Kohima and the control of the road is over. The Japanese altogether have lost around about five and a half thousand men, killed, wounded, lost, missing. There's no really accurate figures able to put on this because so many of the Japanese would be buried under collapsed trenches uh, and bunkers. The British and Indian losses by the same token are around about 1500. The Battle of Kohima was the turning point, one of the main turning points in the, uh, the war against the, and it was here in 1944 that the Japanese invasion of India was halted. Here we see another aerial photograph, this reconnaissance photograph, this time taken from the east uh, and here on the, on the right hand side you can see the road to Imphal snaking just in front of Jail Hill. We see clearer now the daily issue store the field supply depot here with, at the end of the blue arrow, which is coming down, uh, and the Kohima Ridge stretching up there all the way up to the right, up to the left. The main road to, Ke to Imabur comes behind this ridge here, and it goes off down, to, as you see there, Dimapur, off to the top right, top left. Here we see a photograph uh, of, uh, from taken late in 1944 as the remains of the, the fallen are still being collected from around the many battlefields of Kohima, as evidenced by the open graves here. So that, that's the, the start of the Kohima century. This is all where the DC's bungalow was, where the tennis court was, uh, and it's taken, the, 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 the photograph is taken from the base of Garrison Hill. Here we see the same scene some 60 years later. What was hell on earth for the living in 1944 is now peace on earth, for the dead in the 2000s. This is the Kohima epitaph. Anywhere in the world where the Remembrance Day is celebrated or commemorated, the, or when a, uh, a British service person, uh, a fallen British service person is repatriated back to the, to the UK, these are the words that are said. When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. Not a lot of people who say these words actually know that this is called the Kohima epitaph and it's inscribed on a huge monolithic stone at the base of Kohima Ridge uh, uh, in tribute to the men of the second division who fell. As you see here, the next tour that's uh, being led by Indus is uh, in the beginning of October 2001. There it gives you the details there, that the phone number and an email address for you to contact them if you would like to attend. There are still some places available on this tour. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks very much for that, Bob. That was a, extremely interesting. Um, and you just asked if there are any questions and a couple of questions have come in. Uh, so we, we're now going to move across to a Q&A section. And uh, so if you've got any questions you want to ask Bob or, or, or Asiya, uh, then do place them in there. We've, we've got a couple already. Um, but before I get onto those, I've got a couple some some questions of my own, which I'm going to ask. So, Bob, um, from your maps and photographs, it looks as though the terrain is pretty rough. How difficult is it to get to the different battle positions around Kohima? It is quite easy to get to them. The, the, probably the hardest uh, battlefield uh, to get to is uh, Mount Pulabadzi, which is seven and a half thousand feet. The road up to uh, at sort of like a halfway house, a staging post, is, uh, is severely pitted. It's just really a track. But once you get there, the local uh, uh, Nagas from from the, from the area have created a path up there with stepping stones, but it is quite arduous. You have to climb the last 12 to 1500 feet uh, using your muscle power. But the other, all the other ones are really quite easy to get to. Most of them are overgrown with people now, of course, because it's a heavily populated area. Uh, but uh, the, I mean, on one of the tours I had, some guys run up Pulabazi in shorts and flip flops, but they were, soldiers and they were out to prove a point to each other, I think. Excellent. Um, before I move on to my next question, there's a message here from Andy Middlemiss, which says, well done, Bob, super talk, Andy. So thanks very much well for done. your comment, Andy. Um, so next question, um, your next tour dates uh, in October next year, uh, if someone can't um, go on those dates, 
when will you be running the tour next after that? That, that after that, it's, it's difficult to say because uh, the tour obviously depends on on the people who want to do it. So, but if the, if there's just if there isn't an, an absolute an actual tour that's being organized you can contact indus uh directly and they will they will create a small plan for you on your own or or one the two others uh to go out there and they will cater the plan exactly to your needs so you don't actually need to join a tour but it uh the dynamic of the group of people is it makes it much more enjoyable Okay, so you can do individual tours as well as group tours and therefore just get in touch with the team at Indus Experiences and uh, we posted that, uh, the contact details earlier. Uh, talking about the team at uh, Indus Experiences, we're going to bring Asiya in here. Um, Asiya, a question for you. Uh, so my father, for an example, he's over 80 and he wants to go on this tour. Uh, is there an age limit to join the tour? Thank you, uh, Howard. No, there is no such age limit. Um, as long as the participant can arrange for adequate travel insurance uh, and a chaperone if needed, uh, then there is absolutely no age limit uh, on going on the tour, either individually or as part of a group. Obviously, if they're part of a group, we will take added measures um, to make sure that they are well looked after. Um, we did take uh, a vet war veteran uh, off the Battle of Kahima on a tour last year. That was a group tour and it was a little bit amended for him to make it more uh, easier and more enjoyable for him. Um, he was 92 years old last year when he did the tour um, and our youngest participant would have been a boy of about 12 years I think but unfortunately we couldn't arrange chaperone for him um, so you know, that was a bit of a letdown. Uh, he did a wonderful presentation in uh, which he presented at the Kahima um, Museum in York uh, when, when I gave a talk there and would have loved to have taken him, but unfortunately I couldn't go ahead. Um, but our youngest participants who took part in the tour were 27 year old um, twin brothers who visited Kahima in 2017, I believe. Um, and they went to pay respects to their grandfather, Private Raymond Street, uh, who fought in Kahima in 1944. So, so as I said, there are, there's really no such age limit. Um, so everyone is, is welcome. Okay. So, so there's, a, there's quite a, a vast age limit uh, range that's going on there. 93 <laughs> is really old, isn't it? Gosh, um, but good on him for getting out and about. Um, so uh, next question, we, and we, we're being flooded with questions. We're gonna try and get through as many of them as we possibly can. Um, but I'm just, I've, I've got so many questions of my own. So uh, because I'm in the hot seat, I'm going to ask them first. Um, so my next question is, can we add on any other places to the itinerary? Uh, I'll take this one. Yes, yes, that absolutely is possible. Uh, both pre-tour extensions or post-tour extensions are possible. We can add on any place in India all the world, uh, <laughs> practically. Um, in the past, our clients have added on places like Myanmar, uh, as a lot of the uh, a lot of their ancestors are buried in the graves over there. Um, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, uh, they're all attractive options as they are very close by, um, and the air connections are very good. Um, apart from that, for a general sort of leisurely uh, extension. Dubai works very well with the flights as they do go via Dubai. So, so absolutely possible. Brilliant. Um, and we're, we're getting a lot of questions in about the, the actual battle itself, Bob. So I'm going to ask those in just a second. But um, obviously, there's a big pressing question at the moment, which we need to get an answer to. What happens if the tour is cancelled due to COVID-19? Yes, uh, the question of the hour. Um, so we, we aim to be as flexible as possible um, and we have reduced our holiday deposits from £500 to £250 per person until further notice. We have also made it possible to request a refund or postpone travel costs, uh, travel plans at no additional cost in the event that the trip can't go ahead. Um, all the tier for payments uh, to Indus experiences are 100% protected by our Atoll and APTA um, licenses. Being in travel, we have had to deal with numerous uh, situations in the past, uh, whether they're terrorism related, uh, for example, the 9-11 bombings, or if they are climate emergencies, for example, the tsunami, the um, volcanic ash cloud that we had a couple of years ago, uh, or, or uh, any, any such, or these 
of course, coronavirus interruption. Um, so we, we, we have uh, things in place uh, that we will try to uh, be as flexible as possible. Like I said, um, we um, will make re uh, refunds or alter um, holiday plans um, as a bit. We've had many people uh, of our clients who were actually on uh, holiday at the time of this lockdown. Uh, we had a group of 22 in Vienna, uh, which uh, we uh, were able to repatriate back to the UK, uh, get them safely back at home. Um, so, so yes, in travel we deal with a lot of situations and uh, we're well placed. To, to, to handle almost anything, really. Good. So, 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 well, please go on by October next year when this tour is going ahead, things uh, things are back to some form of normality. We, we really hope so. Um, bef before I ask Bob lots of questions about the battle, which is actually what most people question about, there is actually a question here about the hotels that's coming from Jeremy Stiggings. It said, what are the hotels like in Kahima and Imphal? Can you give us a bit of an update on what on what they can expect there? In terms Can I take this one, Asaya? If you want to. Yeah, well, I've stayed in the hotels, uh, and uh, they're very good. The hotels that the Indus uh, put us into, in uh, in general, are, are excellent. They're very modern. the 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 service is good. The food is good, uh, and uh, that's in Kohima. There are, of course, other hotels in Kohima which perhaps that aren't so good, and I've stayed in one or two of those as well. But in general, the hotels that Indus choose are at, at least three star hotels uh, with the service commensurate to that. Great, thank you. So um, we've got a lot of questions, Bob, about the uh, the oh. battle itself. So um, we're going to do our best to try and get through as many of these as we can. Uh, I'm going to start with Alistair McKenzie because he's asked two questions. So his first question is, you talked about the close support given by the Allied artillery at the peak of the battle just prior to 18th of April. Where were the guns sighted? So that's the first question. His second question is, can you talk about the role of the Nagas? Yeah, the, when, when the 161st Brigade came back up to Kohima uh, in that direction from, from Dimapur on the 5th of April, Brigadier Warren, who was the commander of that brigade, realised he couldn't get his whole brigade into Kohima. So he put the West Kents in there uh, and these other two battalions and his artillery, he set off about three miles uh, from Kohima in a place called Jot Summer. Uh, and from there, he had his artillery park where uh, in, in inside the, uh, the garrison, he had Major Yo as one of his battery commanders who had gone there. And Major Yo was the spotter, really, for the artillery. And he brought down um, artillery from, from 161st Brigade initially, but then uh, later from the rest of the 2nd Division artillery as they came up. Uh, he brought it down very accurately indeed sometimes just yards in front of our own positions where it disrupted the Japanese uh, attacks as they were forming. Great. The Nagas, uh, Nagas. Yep. sorry, the Nagas, the, the, the Naga Hill people were very loyal to the British uh, at the, uh, as a result of the, the connection they had with uh, Mr. Charles Pawsey, who was the district commissioner. Pawsey had been the, uh, in the Indian Civil Service since just after the First World War. Uh, and he, they were very loyal to him. The, the, the Nagas uh, ported for us, they guided us, they carried the wounded uh, and all sorts of manner of things like that, but they also killed Japanese. So the Nagas were exceptionally uh, important to the whole thing because they knew the routes, they knew the, the tracks through the almost impenetrable jungle back in those days. So yes, absolutely, the Nagas were vitally important. Great, thank you. Um, which kind of leads me on to the next question, which has come from Jill B. It says, could you say a little more about which British and Indian troops fought here, please, including the odds and sods that you mentioned? Because the situation where Kohima was, it was like a, almost like a halfway house. It was 50 odd miles from Kohima to Dimapur, and it was 70, 80 miles from Kohima to Imphal. And there was a lot of to and fro in all the way through. And when the Japanese cut the road south of Kohima on the Imphal side, all those soldiers and parties of men who were heading down towards Imphal were actually trapped in Kohima. So they would make the, uh, the odds and sods. There would be, although most of them were, were trained soldiers, 
they, they kind of lack the cohesion of the formed units like the West Kent. Uh, so initially, uh, at the, the defensive force were the, the Royal West Kent, the 450 men there. The West Kent had fought the Germans and the Italians, uh, and they were one of the few units that, in their division as well, the 5th Indian Division, they were one of the few units, uh, formations, to fight all three of the Axis powers. So the, the West Kents were quite a, a very well experienced battalion and uh, the cohesion that they had uh, showed quite well. The Assam Regiment was formed, a new formed regiment as I mentioned, it was formed in 1942 and they actually delayed the advance of the Japanese from the, uh, from the east across the hills at a place called Jesemi. Uh, they delayed the advance of the Japanese by about a week really uh, and then they were ordered to break off and, and to make their way back to Kohima. Significant numbers of them did, uh, which is why I called them kind of the, re the remnants of the Assam Regiment. So all in all, in all the, the, the main force of the uh, uh, defense of Kohima, if you like, the opening of the road, was the second British division. And they were a completely British division. They had, uh, they had uh, uh, three brigades. Each brigade had three battalions, plus there was four regiments of artillery, Plus there was signals uh, and uh, ordnance and all of that all combined in there, but they were all British. The 161st Brigade was an Indian Brigade. So in addition to the West Kents, they had the 4th, 7th uh, Rajputs and the 1st, 1st Punjabs. Does that answer it all? Yes, I think so. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I am aware that we've, we, we've, we've, we're running out of time on this um, and there's so many questions that we still haven't answered. So if we don't get your question, I do apologise. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and throw them all into one uh, and see if you can answer as many of these as you can at the same time. So these are the questions. The first one comes from Colonel John Swanston, which says, could you give more details about the tennis court battle? Then there's Nick H, who's asked a whole load of questions, but the one question I'm most interested in knowing about is whether there is a Japanese cemetery or memorial in Kohima. Uh, and then the last question, uh, if you can answer it, has come from Peter Marshall, which says, was this the furthest point of the Japanese invasion into India? I'll take that one as an easy one there. That, well, they're all e relatively easy. Yes, that was the furthest point the Japanese uh, reached. The invasion of India was halted at Kohima and turned around. It was one of the major turning points of the war against the Japanese. The, there is no Japanese memorial at Kohima. <coughs> Pardon me. Just after the war, in the interest of, uh, of uh, really of clearing up, you might say, uh, several, in several of the uh, war cemeteries scattered around India and Burma, Japanese uh, remains were also interred in a separate part of the battlefield uh, it's a separate part of the cemetery to where the British and Indian soldiers were interred. However, uh, the, the Japanese government then sent out what they called bone collectors who traced the route of the Japanese advances all over the Pacific, all over the Far East. Uh, they traced where they fought and where they retreated backwards afterwards and where they were able to find remains, uh, identifiable remains of Japanese soldiers. They repatriated those remains back to Japan. However, down at Imphal, there, there is a, a quite a large memorial to the Japanese there. Uh, there's one that's created by the Japanese themselves and one where the uh, Imphal has done, it's called the, uh, the, uh, the Peace Memorial. Uh, they're kind of co-located by Red Hill, which was a, one of the battle points um, during, the, during the, um, the war against Imphal, the, the battle down at Imphal. Uh, and what was it? Oh, the tennis court. In a, in, a, in a battlefield of such a complexity as Kohima, it's difficult to get all of the details in, in such a short presentation time. The, the tennis court uh, was, was a feature of the DC's compound. And during the, at the height of the battle, it was, it was uh, uh, attacked repeatedly. The, so the, the British Indian soldiers were dug in on one side of it and the Japanese were dug in on the other side of it. Uh, and it, you don't need to be exceptionally strong or accurate. If you're going to throw something across a tennis court, you know it's going to reach the other side. And then if it's something that's going to explode over there, you know it's going to cause casualties. The fighting across the tennis court was severe, as it was in all of the places. 
but uh, the, and it was in the main defended by the Assam Regiment and the Assam Rifles. Great, thanks very much for doing all of those questions in one go. We've just got one more question, um, which is coming from Nigel Tisdall. Uh, I know he, he's, he's, he really wants an answer to this question because he's posted <laughs> it in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and I wanted to leave it to last because, um, so, so Nigel is a freelance journalist and hopefully will be using this information to create some articles to promote the, the tour. So he, he wants to know, can you recommend any relevant books? There are a large number of books uh, which have been written about Kohima and the Burma campaign. Uh, one or two which I'll specifically mention. Uh, the one is by, it's, it's an Osprey book by Dr. Robert Lyman, and it's called Kohima 1944. Another book which is called uh, Kohima, The Furthest Battle, was written by Leslie Edwards. Now this is, this is not uh, your sort of, um, a coffee table type of book. This is a, it's actually very quickly turned into a reference book. Uh, I, I took uh, Les Edwards out to Kohima with me in 2014 and um, uh, it, it turned out he wrote this great book, but it was the first time he'd ever visited the ground. So, that, but there are other, many other books. Uh, let me just think of another one now. Um, Arthur Swinson uh, wrote a book in the 50s, 60s. Uh, he was a, a major on the staff of second division. And he, he wrote a very definitive book on the Battle of Kohima. Uh, so there's, there's, it's very, very good. Uh, Bob Street, uh, who uh, is one of the trustees of the museum, he's written uh, several books, excuse me, <coughs> about his father's experiences. We have mentioned the private Raymond Street before, uh, and uh, Bob Street, in collaboration with his dad, uh, wrote the books about Ray's uh, experiences out in Kohima and Nympho uh, and uh, Burma. If anybody yep. has questions which we haven't got time to answer on here, uh, they could contact me uh, at the museum uh, and the email address is quite simple. It's Kohima Museum at yahoo.co.uk. So that brings us to the end of the first in our series of events promoting Indus Experiences tours. Uh, we will be in touch to let you know about future events. In the meantime, thank you to Asiya and Bob for their valuable input today. Uh, this event has been timed to coincide with the Remembrance Sunday this weekend. I hope you will stop for a minute to reflect on the many lives lost in the various conflicts over the years, the COVID pandemic included. Please do get in touch with the team at Indus Experiences to discuss your trips in 2021 when we hope to be traveling again. Thank you all for coming.